And time permitting, we'll do a little question and answer session. Cool. So this is a screenshot from the life, uh, lifetime support policy, and you can see it starts back at about version 10 or so. I think I cut off version 9, yeah. Um, you do not see version 12 on here yet. We haven't published it. Uh, we are expecting that to be available shortly. Uh, I don't know exactly what the timelines will be for 12. Uh, they're still trying to uh, figure out what the best approach is there. But as soon as they become available, this document will get updated with that information. Uh, but what I did want to do is make sure that everybody's aware of um, the support of the older versions because I know many of you are likely using old versions. In fact, how many of you are using versions older than 11? Well, maybe 30, 40 percent or so. So quite a bit, quite a bit. So if you're here, I'm imagining that you're probably interested in getting off those old versions. Otherwise, I probably have nothing interesting to offer you. So to give you an idea of what you're going to get as you come forward off of versions older than 10, uh, these are some of the highlighted features that were delivered in each of those versions. Keep in mind, uh, they are not uh, representative of a complete list. They're just some of the, the, key, the key features that were delivered in those versions. And obviously, the last box there talks about version 12, which I'm going to cover in a little bit more detail shortly. So lots of reasons to get off of those new versions, or the old versions onto the new version. Um, hopefully, by the end of this session, you'll have some more interest in doing that. And with that, welcome Form C. 12C. I'm excited. We put a lot of work into this. Um, for those of you, like I said, that, that know me and the team around it, um, compared to the other product teams at Oracle, we are a relatively small team, so uh, I definitely have to uh, appreciate the amount of work that our developers did getting us to here. Let's take a look at some of those features. Actually, before I do that, I want to mention that uh, with me today, not here in the room, but downstairs in the uh, exhibit hall, is uh, Phil Kuhn, who is our director of software development for Forms. If you guys have any um, real low-level technical questions about Forms, that's going to be your guy to ask uh, in the event that I can't get to those. But he'll be here on and off with me throughout the week, so by all means, come say hello to us down there. So let's take a look at what we did. And again, if anyone has questions along the way, please stop me, and um, I'll be happy to uh, see what we can do. So the first thing I want to do is um, I want to attack the elephant in the room because I'm sure, well, I'll ask anyway. How many of you are sitting here saying, well, with all this talk about Java plugins not being supported by browsers, what are we going to do, right? I'm sure most of you are asking yourself that question. So let's, let's answer that one first. So this is the information that we have uh, as of just a few days ago, uh, what's going on. Uh, by now, most everyone should know that Chrome no longer supports plugins in general. Um, the Java plugin being, to us, one of the more important ones. Firefox has indicated that they will uh, de-support uh, the use of the Netscape API, which is required for the plugin, around the December 2016 timeframe. If you remember on the previous slide, uh, the way the dates work for the older versions, uh, Forms 12 excuse me, Forms 11 G Release 2 uh, ends its premier support at roughly the same time as Firefox will drop the plugin. And for Microsoft, thank you Microsoft, um, they continue to support Internet Explorer into the Windows 10 world. Um, based on their traditional approach, um, that browser likely will be supported through the life of Windows 10. Um, as far as Edge goes, we'll talk to that in just a second as well. So here's what we're going to do different from before for version 12. Uh, on the left, what you're looking at is the delivery configuration that most of you are familiar with uh, today and from the past. Um, the delivery is just a traditional applet embedded in an HTML page. Uh, it will continue to be the default configuration. Uh, just as before, it will fully support uh, single sign-on. It will support the new feature that we delivered in 12, which allows single sign out. And it will also continue to support JavaScript <laughs> integration. The downside of it is that it requires both a browser and a Java plugin. One of the new configurations we're going to deliver will be similar to the applet embedded in HTML, except for it's going to be JNLP embedded in HTML. 
Um, effectively, it's a web start application embedded in a web page, which is a little different from what traditionally you would see with web start. Um, it will be very similar to the applet embedded in HTML, uh, have the same support. Um, I added the third bullet, or excuse me, the second bullet there, a sub bullet, um, just because I thought it was kind of cool. Um, the JNLP code that's delivered to the client becomes base64 encoded, uh, which basically means if you do a view source on the browser, um, the text will not be human readable. Um, that is not a security feature. Um, it's the way uh, this process works, but it is kind of nice because for the, um, the end users that like to poke around and tinker around with uh, configurations and settings, they won't necessarily be able to read what they're looking at, so that's kind of neat. But again, it's same same issue here. You're still going to be required to have a browser and a Java plugin. Here's where the cool stuff happens. So on the left-hand side, uh, we say that we picked up Java Web Start support. However, what we're going to deliver is actually what I'm going to call an enhanced version of Java Web Start. Uh, what we wanted to do was make sure that you had similar behavior to what you saw in previous versions, and by that I mean the ability to have dynamically generated applications. So if an administrator wants to make a change on the server side, the next time the application runs, you'll pick up that change on the client side. With traditional web start, it doesn't work that way. With traditional web start, you have a static JNLP file on the client, you run it, and you end up with same old, same old, even if there's changes on the server. This will help to give you the ability to change that, um, that client side behavior as changes are made on the server. Uh, in this particular scenario, um, you will continue to have limited single sign-on support, and I say limited in the sense that it will require you to have a browser if you want to use single sign-on with Web Start. But if you do not use single sign-on, you don't need the browser. Once the Web Start application is brought down to the client, you don't need the browser anymore. The user basically double clicks on a shortcut and off it goes, no browser involved. So that's kind of nice. Uh, because there's no browser, there's no single sign-out support, which again is a new feature in 12. Not the fact that it doesn't work, but the fact that we have single sign-out support. JavaScript integration is the same way. Because there's no browser, obviously, there's no JavaScript to integrate with. Uh, it will require either the JDK or uh, some Java installation on the client. But again, um, we will not be using the plugin component of the installation. And again, the browser is optional in this case and really only needed if you decide to use single sign-on or want to take advantage of the dynamic changes that occur by the administrator on the server. Okay. The last option, um, at the moment we didn't come up with a great name, so we're just going to call it standalone. In short, it's going to run just like old school client server in that um, it will act just like a Java application on the client tier. Um, it is completely browserless. So no worries about what browsers are certified with forms and does this browser support plugins and what security vulnerabilities are an issue with this browser this week. We're done with it. We don't need those problems anymore. One less problem to worry about. The downside to it, like I said, uh, with Web Start is that because there's no browser, all the browser functionality that you otherwise would have had in an application you can't do here because there's no browser. So it comes with a little bit of a payback or a price. The last bullet there was more for my own note than anything else. Um, what we did, uh, because there's some command line syntax that's involved, um, we created a little example page uh, to show you how, how that standalone executable is used. And that's where you would find it in your installation uh, to, from, a, what, from a browser, not from, a, uh, from the system. Okay. So now you've got four choices before you only had one. Uh, hopefully one of those options will uh, at least get you started and uh, get your get your concerns settled a little bit over the, the Java plugin part of the problem. So here's Windows 10, at least a developer install um, prior to its release, uh, running Forms 12. On the left-hand side, it's running out of what was called at the time Microsoft Spartan, now Edge. And on the right is Forms 12 running in Chrome on Windows 10. So it can be done. Also in 12, we introduced uh, the ability to integrate with BI Publisher. 
Um, this was a choice uh, that we made based on requests from you guys, from customers. We had customers that wanted a newer uh, reporting solution, um, and we felt like this was a good a good approach to go forward. Uh, with this I, uh, with this implementation, you'll be able to take advantage of uh, either or or both Oracle Reports or BI Publisher. You choose which one you want, or you could do both at the same time. It's entirely up to you. The way in which you code to make uh, the integration work is very similar to how you would have done it with Oracle Reports, so nothing really new to learn. Um, and I added some features in there about uh, BI Publisher, it really has nothing to do with forms, but I thought it was kind of neat. So with BI Publisher, you have the ability to send uh, the report output to multiple destinations at the same time, which is really kind of neat. So if you want to send the output to 25 uh, email addresses and four printers and, and whatever, whatever it is you want to do, you can do that all at one time, so that's really kind of neat. Uh, calls out to BI Publisher from forms are asynchronous, meaning um, fire and go. Um, the form doesn't have to sit there and wait on a response back from BI Publisher, which is kind of kind of nice. And if you want the application to wait, that'll be up to you to code that into your application. Um, the BI Publisher integration is um, going to take advantage of the JVM controller in forms, meaning that, uh, like Oracle Reports, if you're finding that uh, you have an application that makes many significant requests out to BI Publisher, and it seems to be um, a little bit of a performance hog on the server because of that, the JVM controller could help balance out that load and pick up some, uh, pick some performance back up. So that's kind of nice as well. Speaking of JVM pooling or the JVM controller, we've made some significant changes here as well. Um, before it was basically an on and off type of a, a feature. Um, very limited diagnostics, very limited control, very limited customization that you could do to it. Um, because we knew that more and more of you were using Java in your applications um, on the server side, uh, more of you are making calls out to reports and uh, BI Publisher now, um, the need to get uh, improvements in the JVM controller was important. So what we did was we kind of modeled after what you normally see in like a web server, right? We added the ability to do uh, uh, a least loaded host, or at least loaded first type of an option, as well as a round robin option. So that's kind of a neat way to balance out the load uh, with the JVM controller. Auto child removal, and I'm not going to go into a whole lot of technical detail here, but just to give you an idea, um, the way it used to work is that the JVM controller would spawn off children as it needed it. The problem was those children would continue to run even if they weren't needed anymore, obviously wasting resources on the server. Now you'll have the ability to have those children processes um, terminated when they're no longer needed. Again, recovering resources back to the machine and then indirectly picking up some performance. Uh, I mentioned diagnostics earlier. For those of you that know me, I come from the support world, so anytime we can improve um, the ability to troubleshoot problems, we want to do that as well. So we've improved some of the logging behavior of the JVM controller. And similar to the removal of the children processes uh, is the ability to free global references. And again, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of technical detail, um, but again, in previous versions, um, these were maintained through the life of the controller and not released until shutdown time. So at least now that, um, that resource that was used by the controller will be freed up as needed. So that's kind of a nice change as well. Speaking of performance improvements, and that seems to be the theme here, We've made vast changes to the record manager. Uh, for those of you that don't know the lower levels of forms, uh, deep in the heart of the forms product, and probably one of the more important parts of the forms product internally, is its record manager. He's kind of the layer that takes responsibility for collecting the data from the database when it's requested, uh, and then processing it and determining what the best approach is for saying, sending it out to the client, and then the reverse. Uh, what we've done here was, um, <laughs> An idea that sparked from Larry Ellison's session last year, his keynote session, talking about the 12C database in memory option. Uh, after I saw that, I thought, well, goodness, couldn't we do the same thing? Uh, apparently, uh, we could. The way we used to take, uh, take control of the records that were returned from the database is we would store them in a file on the file system on the server. And it occurred to me how wasteful that was, both in disk space and time and processing power. 
Our developers went back and investigated the possibility of breaking away from archiving that information in files and instead put it into memory and handling it um, in a way in which we could actually reduce the memory footprint, which is really um, kind of contradictory. Uh, but apparently, we did it. Um, at best, our, our benchmarking showed an increase, or, or an improvement, I should say, of about 50%. So what that means is that the amount of memory per record that was used was reduced by 50% as a max. Um, on average, we, we saw improvements by about 10% or so. So for cases where you're, uh, the record data being returned back to the client um, is significant, obviously your benefit is gonna be much greater. In an example like I have here on the screen, you're probably hardly even gonna notice a change because there's, you know, there's no real significant data there. But most of this is gonna be transparent to you. By default, we're gonna take advantage of the in-memory option so you don't need to do anything. Right out of the box, this will be turned on. New system events were introduced as um, somewhat of a complement to um, the original external event, which gave you the ability to integrate with advanced queuing. System events will function in a similar way. Uh, they're basically gonna listen for various things that occur outside of the scope of forms, at least in most cases. So the first one, which was probably the most popular one, at least from a request point of view, was the ability to monitor for client idle, meaning the application is just sitting there and no one's doing anything with it, right? The user got up when he got a cup of coffee and started a water cooler talk. As a developer, you'll be able to have the application monitor that time. How much time did the application sit there doing nothing? Uh, Based on the setting that you choose, whatever it is, five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, uh, you decide what happens. You could either exit their application, you could pop up a message that says, hey, quit being lazy, go back to work. It's entirely up to you. We are not gonna take control of that. We're gonna leave it up to you guys, the developers, yes. You could code anything that you could have coded in any other scenario. So we're not we're not actually doing anything. We're just listening for the occurrence. So, for example, when the time the internal timer expires and says five minutes has elapsed, we just say, you know, hey, application, I just want to let you know five minutes has elapsed. What do you want to do? Okay. Database idle will be very similar to that. Um, imagine a scenario where the user is, is actually active in the application, but they're not doing anything that's specifically interacting with the database. Right? They're bouncing around, they're looking at data, um, just depends on your application. Uh, for us, we keep a persistent connection with the database. Uh, maybe for a lot of you this isn't going to be the case, but for some of our customers, you know, we've, we have customers running you know, 10, 20, 30, 50, 100,000 end users. That's a lot of database connections. If the application could monitor, monitor for those connections or the idle ones and disconnect as necessary, we'd eliminate some of that pressure that's on the database. Um, I have a, a demo downstairs how, where I show, you know, after a given amount of time, a dialogue pops up and says, you know, hey, you haven't done anything in the database for five minutes. Are you sure you still want to keep this connection open? And you could choose to either disconnect or reconnect as needed. That's kind of nice. Third option is single sign-off. Uh, the single sign-off functionality that I mentioned in the very beginning is actually kind of threefold. Um, as an event, what this means is that if a single sign-off event occurs in another uh, browser instance, we will hear it. So imagine a case where a form is running in tab one and, I don't know, an ADF application is running in tab two. If you single sign-off on the ADF application, we will know it happens which means you could choose again what to do. You could choose to do nothing, which is what happens today. Or you could choose to log out of the form or say, hey, your ADF application logged out. What do you want to do? You want to relaunch it. So we're going to, we're going to listen for that event to occur. We're also, and I'm going to get a little out of track here, and I'm going to mention it because we're talking about it. Um, we also introduced the ability to uh, do single sign out on demand. So programmatically, if you want to execute a single sign off from SSO, you could do that. Uh, for example, in a post form trigger, uh, when the form is exiting, maybe you also want to log out of single sign on as well. You'll be able to do that. Uh, the third option is to have the form automatically single sign out upon exiting, or a clean exit, I should say. So there's three variations of that single sign out that we introduced. 
The third option, which is also kind of cool, is system notifications. What system notifications is going to do for you is give you the ability from Fusion Middleware Control to send messages out to the running forms application. Um, probably going to be most valuable in cases where, for example, um, you have regular maintenance that occurs. Let's say, for example, I don't know, at 5 p.m. every day. Uh, you could have an administrator send a message out to all the running applications, and from the end user's point of view, they might get a pop-up message that says, you know, hey, the system's going to be shut down in five minutes. Please be sure to save all your work and exit as soon as possible. So the administrator can now interact a little bit with the end users. You could do that, you could do that to all the users or uh, individual users, depending upon uh, how the administrator chooses to do that. The last one is media completion, and if you guys saw my little slip up there where I went to the next slide, you'll see that we're about to introduce audio support back into forms, which we lost when we went to web many years ago. In this particular case, we're not going to introduce it uh, as part of any record handling. It's more going to be treated uh, like images you'd find in buttons, right? It's just extra uh, audible cues that you could add to your application whether it's just a pretty little startup song that your application plays at startup, or maybe help system information, uh, or just again, just audible cues that something occurred, uh, you'll be able to do that. That media completion system event is the ability to listen for when the, the audio file has completed its play and reached the end of its timeline. So at the end of playing this audio file, what do you want to do? Maybe you want to play it again, maybe you want to play a different one, maybe you want to exit the form or whatever it is you want to do again, you will code that yourself. So again, we added audio support, as I mentioned. Uh, we implemented it using JavaFX. Um, again, we won't have to go into too much technical detail, but the point of it is that we will support the formats that the JavaFX um, technology supports, with the exception of the streaming formats. Uh, at the moment, we've only introduced a play, pause, stop, and um, mute functionality. Uh, going forward, we may introduce the ability to shuffle through the timeline. Uh, we're going to have to look at how much interest there is in this feature as to whether or not it's worth doing that. And, oops, wrong one. There we go. Also on the list of GWiz is the color scheme of the application. Um, lots of requests have come in for this, the ability to customize the color scheme. Out of the box, we used to deliver as a default uh, what was called teal, although in my opinion it was never teal, it was more of a pine green kind of a color, yuck. Um, very commonly used though, I, I apologize, um, very commonly used, uh, but we definitely had requests to have the ability to customize those color schemes. Um, with this first implementation, you'll be able to do that in somewhat of a limited way. Um, our approach going forward is going to be to actually expand this a little bit further. Uh, what you have here are nine attributes that you could uh, adjust as an administrator. You do not have to be a developer, so the application does not need to be changed in any way. Uh, but going forward, we'll introduce um, some additional attributes uh, to this as well. Um, what you see there are hex values for the colors. You don't necessarily have to use hex values. You could use RGB sets, right? So like 255, comma, 100, comma, whatever, um, to choose your values. That sample is already included. Uh, the settings are in the registry.dat file, for those of you that are familiar with that. Uh, but out of the box, that's already configured for you. So if you wanted to go back and try that, uh, all you have to do is uh, add the applet parameter to your URL and uh, add the name sample to it, right? So custom color scheme equals sample, and you'll see what this fancy set of colors looks like. It's not pretty, I assure you. We did that on purpose. Uh, we added the ability to add icons to the tab canvas page, or pages. Um, previously, you were not able to do that. In this particular example, and this is actually a picture I've used now for quite some time, uh, the icons here are not real lovely, but they, they do make a point. Um, the tab label size will adapt to the size of the picture, so I don't recommend um, images much larger than uh, 16 by 16 pixels, which is the same size as you find uh, in the title bar of a window. 
so you don't want to you don't really want to go any larger than that. Um, the support for formats will be similar to buttons, right? Web formats, JPEGs, and GIFs, and PNG files. At the moment, uh, this is not, uh, you cannot implement this from a declarative way in the builder just yet. In other words, in the property palette, you have to do this programmatically, at least for the time being. Uh, hopefully in the version uh, following this one, we will add the appropriate uh, declarative section in the property palette. The recommended delivery for those icons or images, um, like any other that we've re recommended in the past, would be jar files. You don't have to do it with jar files, but you're likely to get Java security warnings if you don't. The logon dialog and change dialog boxes. Uh, you now will have the ability to introduce uh, text onto those fields, whereas before those were not customizable at all. The login dialog box obviously is going to be a little less important, I think. Right? What are you going to put in that? You know, passwords are case sensitive. That's about the only thing logical I can think of to put in that in the, that particular dialog. But the password change dialog box is a little bit more significant. Um, there, you're likely to want to introduce the company's rules. Maybe on the new passwords, you have to have upper and lowercase letters. You have to include numbers, whatever the case is. Now you could give that information to the end users um, right in front of them. So let's talk about design time. I wasn't actually going to do this because we didn't introduce a whole lot into the builder, um, but I wanted to share some of the things we changed anyway, uh, just because I thought they were kind of neat. Um, again, some of these slides I've used in other sessions over the years, kind of hinting as to what we were working on. Um, in the property palette of the builder, you now have the ability to reset multiple properties at the same time. In the past, you couldn't do that. In the past, you had to do them one at a time. Um, I know that may seem trivial, but to be quite honest to me, time is money. If I have to click, if I want to reset 10 properties, I have to click once on each property and once on the reset button, you know, that's 20 clicks. In this particular case, I select all of the 10 properties, that's 10 clicks. One click on the reset button is a, a total of 11 clicks. So I've, I've cut my clicking in half uh, by introducing this behavior. So a little bit of a time saver. <laughs> The layout editor saw some minor improvements. Um, we picked up um, mouse cursor icons uh, for graphical objects. Again, nothing too exciting, but kind of a nice, helpful adjustment. Uh, in version 10, we introduced the XML converter, which seems to be most popular um, with people that do their own source control. Whatever the reason is you use XML files, um, prior to version 12, the only way to convert to XML was on the command line. Um, starting with 12, we introduce um, within the builder the ability to do those right from in the builder in the UI, so that's kind of helpful. WebUtil, big topic of discussion, at least from um, the support world. Uh, lots of customers have asked and even complained about the need to have the third-party library, Jacob, to do Olay functionality, even if you're not using it. Although we were not able to come away from needing Jacob, in cases where your application does not integrate with products like Microsoft Office and others, um, this will give you the ability to have an application use WebUtil without the dependency on the third-party libraries. Right, so one less jar file to sign, one less headache to worry about. Again, subtle changes. Um, the old 16-bit file dialog box has been replaced with a little bit more of a modern dialog box. File open, save dialog box. Um, access to the builder, or excuse me, to the form's help or content in general has been added directly to the builder. Uh, so historically, you only had access to the form builder help. Now you'll have access to the documentation library, the OTN forums, the builder help, and eventually we'll probably add more to that as well. That way from one place you'll have uh, quick links to all of that information. I know finding the documentation on the Oracle websites tends to be a little hair pulling at times. Uh, this will make that a little bit easier for you. Hopefully also the introduction of the OTN forum link here will encourage you guys to use that as well. Um, I find that it's, it's probably been pretty helpful to a lot of people over the years. I know I monitor it pretty closely, and it's kind of interesting to see some of the topics that come through there. 
um, some very simple, some very complex, and you know, if you don't want to go through uh, the effort of working with support, um, this is a, a good alternative for less critical issues. Um, some miscellaneous changes that we added, I'm certainly not going to go through them in, in detail, but if you take a quick glance at, at the, uh, the labeling of them, you should be able to roughly understand what they are or what they do. Um, but you can see many, many changes. Uh, some of these are completely new, some are enhancements to existing properties and average parameters and environment variables and, and such. Um, but the point is that there have been a lot of changes. Um, Rest assured though, what, what you have today in 11 will work in 12. Nothing gets broken, no changes required. Uh, if you're on version 11, recompile and go. You're now using version 12. All of this new stuff doesn't have to mean anything to you. So getting to 12 is really simple if you're on either of the version 11s and move forward. Um, there were a couple in here I wanted to pull out. Bear with me just a second. Oh, the cursor style. So in the middle, the third one down, talks about the cursor style. What that's a reference to is the mouse cursor. In the previous versions, the only way to ch change the mouse cursor uh, at runtime was at the application level, which was kind of inefficient because I know a lot of people have asked, well, it'd be really neat if we could do like a hyperlink object on a canvas. Well, now you kind of can. If you create a display item, Set the cursor, cursor icon to hand, is what it's called. You get the little finger pointer. Um, you now have what looks like a hyperlink. I right, create an underlined display item, uh, create a um, when mouse click trigger on it, and you now just created a hyperlink. No PJC involved, no Java bean, just simple display item and a mouse cursor. So kind of a neat little visual effect. But again, lots of stuff here. Uh, so by no means were my developers uh, without things to do. Again, more miscellaneous stuff. I'm not going to go through these. Uh, I've actually already been told that using bullets like this is sleepy for everybody, so I don't want to do that. Uh, but again, just a quick glance, you can see we, uh, we hit every aspect of, uh, of the product. The one that I will mention, though, is the one right in the middle. The one that talks about storing the RADs in OPSS. Uh, to expand on that in, um, in simpler terms, the remote access descriptors are what are used by forms for single sign-on. That information historically was required to be stored in Oracle's OID LDAP server, right? Oracle Internet Directory. That was a requirement. You had to use Oracle's OID server. The result of us moving the RADs to OPSS, which is uh, the repository that's required with the installation, you now have the ability to use whatever LDAP server you want as long as it's compatible with Oracle Access Manager. So whether it's Microsoft uh, Active Directory, uh, Oracle Universal Directory, Oracle Virtual Directory, and the list goes on and on and on of, of the various ones it supports. So we now break free of that dependency and you guys get to choose. So that should uh, free up a little bit of stress as well again. The other thing we changed with the remote access descriptors is how you will administer them or maintain them. Uh, we moved that functionality into Fusion Middleware Control, uh, which is probably where it should have been in the first place. So now you'll get a nice, prettier interface to uh, take responsibility for those RADs. Uh, we also included a migration utility directly in it. So if you want to migrate your OID RADs into OPSS, literally with a click of a button, they will get transitioned or pulled into your OPSS environment, and you could do away with your OID environment or do whatever it is you need to do with it. Okay. So that was kind of a nice change as well. The other real um, significant change uh, that you see on this slide is the, the second to last one that talks about the form builder only install. I had an interesting question get raised on the forum already about this one. Um, why didn't reports do this? Let me first explain what this is. During the installation process, you're asked to install either forms and reports or the form builder only. What the form builder only is going to do for you is, as it suggests, is you're going to get the form builder only. Um, there will be no runtime component, um, so no way to run your forms directly on that machine unless you've chosen to do a second installation of the full install. The idea is that you'll get the form builder and its utilities 
Uh, you could work in your source code, you could convert to XML, you could do whatever you have to do from a development point of view, except for run. Uh, when you're ready to run, you take your, your form, you move it onto a server, you compile it and you run it. Uh, this gives you a little bit more of a lighter weight environment, uh, especially for smaller machines uh, where you could work in your code and not have to uh, bog it down. Uh, regarding reports and why, didn't, why they didn't do it, um, and the ability to do what we did on the form side just wasn't going to be technically feasible, uh, at least not at this time. So for now, forms is the only one that will offer that. Um, you can, however, during the configuration, choose to not install certain parts of reports. So if, if you're looking for a more developer-like environment, you can still do that, um, just not quite so easily as you can here. Um, this slide I added at about 6 o'clock this morning at the request of a few people that I've come across in the past day or so already uh, talking about the installation. Um, this is a vastly summarized set of steps to do the installation. I will, I will go through these bullets for your benefit um, so that when you go back, at least if you're the one responsible for this, you will have a, a rough idea of what to do. So obviously you want to make sure you take a look at the documentation. That is always your key, and I don't say that just because I wear an Oracle hat. Uh, the documentation, whether it's the certification guides, system requirements guides, are the difference between you having a successful experience or not. Uh, installing on an uncertified platform, not a good idea. That's asking for failure. Missing you know, Unix packages that are required for the operating system, recipe for failure. So if you choose to not read the documentation, then understand it may go wrong for you. Um, the first thing you're going to need is a 64-bit JDK. We are not delivering 32-bit software anymore, not for the servers. So Windows 7 32-bit will not be on the list of supported platforms, nor will XP, nor will Windows 3.1. So all those old platforms are gone. The next thing you'll need after the Java installation is WebLogic Server, specifically the WebLogic Server distribution referred to as infrastructure. After you install it, you'll start to install your middleware components, in this particular case, forms and reports. What's really cool about this release is, let's say, for example, you also wanted BI, Business Intelligence, BI Publisher. You could install that, at this point, into the same Oracle Home. So install all the stuff you want into the bucket, and then the next thing you'll do is create the repository, as it says into the third, third to last bullet there. And then you'll create the domain with the config wizard, start up all the servers, and that last bullet will finalize the configuration. It really is not as difficult as it may sound. There are some steps involved, uh, but generally speaking, it's a pretty easy process. Um, generally speaking, you can have this installed in a matter of minutes for your most simple uh, architectures. So kind of cool. So what do we do beyond 12? I bet you never thought you'd hear me say that. What are we going to do beyond 12? I told you we weren't done. When I stood up here three years ago, I told you we're not done yet. Pay attention. <laughs> we are going forward. Um, we're, uh, we're going to go forward a little bit more rapidly than we did in the past, so you might start to see releases come out a little bit sooner. Um, but that also means that the number of new features will uh, not be quite as significant as this. But we are looking at a lot of things. Um, obviously, cloud is on the top of the radar. Uh, we are working on some cloud solutions. Um, I don't know exactly how those will look just yet, um, but I'm hopeful that here shortly we will uh, get some cloud solutions available for forms. Application packaging and deployment is also on our radar. Um, we've talked with a lot of customers that tell us about applications that are 1,000 modules, 2,000 modules, and you know crazy configurations. We want to make that easier for you. When it's time to move from box to box, there's no reason for you to have to figure out how do you get it from machine A to machine B. You should be able to zip that stuff up, move it onto another machine, click a button, and have us do all the work for you. That's what we're going to do. There's no reason for you to have to go through the pain of compiling and setting up the configuration. We're going to do all that for you. Uh, the advanced configuration in that third bullet, what we're talking about there is the ability to have a little bit more control in Fusion Middleware control. Right now you're kind of forced to do uh, changes one line at a time. Uh, we're going to give you access to everything. We're going to continue to add new Apple parameters to uh, give you the ability to more easily customize your application without changing the application code. 
I mentioned the custom color schemes. We're going to continue to expand on that. Uh, we are looking at some new UI components, which I know is something we haven't done in a long time other than that tab canvas change. Um, we are looking at some new UI components. Uh, we're going to continue with web util improvements, security features, uh, diagnostics, and we will definitely be looking at the new client configuration options I talked about earlier. We'll uh, definitely be looking at expanding on those a little bit. Good stuff? Maybe? Maybe not? There's a lot more, I just don't have the time. So here's our contact information for those of you that generally don't monitor the forums or the product page. I encourage you to at least once go take a look at it and see what kind of information is out there. Uh, with this new version coming out, I assure you that over the next few days and weeks, we will be adding more and more information to it. At this moment, there's no white papers or anything. We will have that stuff out shortly. I am on Twitter. I'll be sharing information at the show while I'm here. We do have a demo down in the exhibit hall. Come say hello. Uh, 